Okay, it is November 2nd. We're picking up after a one-week hiatus we missed last week. So two weeks ago, we ended in chapter 12, about verse 8 in, uh, in uh, Bereshit, in the very beginning in Genesis. So we'll pick up there just to remind us and get us back on the same page. We had in verse 7 that the Lord appeared to Avram. We looked at how that appearance might have been, so I won't go into that now. I'll tell you, look to the last class. Um, but he appeared to him and he said, to your descendants, I'll give this land. And notice he didn't promise it to Avram at this point. He does in the very next chapter. We cheated and we looked ahead. <laughs> but he didn't at this point. He's promising it to his descendants, to his seed. And Avram's listening and um, uh, being obedient to the word of God, recognizing God for who he is, the one true and living God, the God of Israel, as we call him today also. And he built there an altar to the Lord. Uh, we see wherever he was, when he was in right fellowship with the Lord, we see him build altars continually. The altar was a place where he worshiped the Lord. It was uh, an altar of sacrifice. He is sacrificing of himself to show God, put, giving God that honor and that place. This time here in verse 7 or 8, whichever it was, verse 8, I guess, was the second time he built an altar. We're going, going to see a third time not too long from now also. And it said um, in, yeah, the, the end of verse 8, where he builds the altar that he called upon the name of the Lord. We saw that name was Jehovah. And we know that, that when God is working with the people in an intimate and special relationship, that's the name he uses. So uh, that's why it was fitting that that's the name that is put here. One last thing to remember from verse 8 also is Bethel, Beit El, house of God is what it means, was on the west. Um, Ai, you say Ai, on the east is heap of ruin. And it's often the spiritual life that man lives is between those two, either in the house of God or in a heap of ruin. Well, I know which one I want to be in, <laughs> so we all need to be sure that we're leaning uh, and moving to be in the house of God, Beit El. We go into verse 9 and see that his journey is continuing on. He's going toward the Negev. Negev is a name that we still hear Israel call her desert area in the south to this day. It means dry. And that's what it is. It's dry. It's a desert. And that's why it's still called the Negev to this day. This is the large southern part of Israel's desert. And that's why sometimes they'll use interchangeably south. If they tell you in Israel, go south, they're telling you to go to the Negev. Uh, there are areas of that land, that, that desert, that are beautiful now, blossoming and blooming because Israel's learned how to use drip irrigation. They've learned how to... to take the salt out of the water from like um, the Dead Sea, the desalinization, um, the, even from the Mediterranean that, that's near there and been able to use that. Um, they grow great date palms right next to salty waters and salty soil. It's amazing what God's enabled them to do. But at this point, I think it probably was far more arid and barren you know, than the recent developments that, that I'm talking about. By the time Avram comes down through the south, he's pretty much now traveled the length of the land that God had told him he would show him. He's told him, he sent him out saying, go to the land I show you. Didn't tell him where, but told him there was a land he wanted to show him. Just a few verses ago, we saw that he said, okay, I'm going to give this land to your descendants. So we're getting a bit more of uh, the picture that is in stages. And I just want to remind you of 12, chapter 12, verse 1, God said he would show it to him. That's why Avram had to walk through it so he could see it. Now that he's just about done all of that and he's pointed toward the south, and we know below Israel on the map to this day is the land called Egypt. Uh-oh, that's a foreshadowing warning there. <laughs> but let's read it in order. We'll start with verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land. Famine, lack of food. So Avram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. Okay, famine here and often in Scripture is a test of faith. This was a test of Avram's faith. 
He's seeing a lack for the supplies that he needs. Remember, he's got all kinds of herds and you know cattle and sheep. He's got servants. He's got family. You know, a lot of mouths to feed. Shall I put it that way? Would he trust God to supply his needs, or would he seek his own solution? Well, we see exactly from this verse what he did. He, we don't hear that God told him go south into Egypt. God told him to go through the land that he was showing him. And now we hear that Avram decided to go down to Egypt. And often when we are in a dry period spiritually, we are in a test of our faith. And this is when we need to plug in all the more to our God and make sure that we're following him and not our own, oh, I think I need to do this. Oh, okay, I'll do that. He goes down, and it's made very clear there. Yes, he's moving south, but the way it's, it's phrased here that he went down into Egypt, I'm going to say that was a downward move for him spiritually as well as physically. We don't read here that he sought the counsel of the Lord. We don't read here that he stopped and he prayed, God, feed us. God, help us. We don't read any of that. I'm bringing this out to show you that Avram, this man who, when we get done with a third of Genesis, will have looked at his life for a long time. Remember, it's 312 times that his name is used in 272 verses, and he's in Hebrews, you know, he's in Romans, he's mentioned other places in our scripture. We see him called a friend of God. We see his faith, and we, we talk about the faith of Avram, and rightfully so, but... He isn't the one who walked on water. <laughs> he wasn't perfect. And here we're seeing God lets us see the ups and the downs, the, the good and the bad, the mistakes as well as the, the great times in our, our um, what do I call them, Bible characters' lives. Because I think God's wanting us to realize we can meet Avram in this. I'm sure that you can think of a time in your mind right now where you knew you were in a spiritual desert and maybe you didn't make the right decision also. Well, notice how God's going to deal with it. God's not going to say, well, Avram, I'm going to leave you down in Egypt. I'm going to walk away from you now. You walked away from me. See ya. So long. Done with you. I'll go get somebody else. No, we see God remain faithful. And we're going, we're going to see Abram come back into that right fellowship with God. So all of you who buy that lie when you're, you're being tugged up to come back, oh, but I, I'm too ashamed, or God couldn't have anything for me anymore, those are lies out of the pit of hell. God's never done with us, because remember, he's not looking for our abilities, just our availabilities. He's looking for us to allow him to change us and to grow us up in him, and that's why he allows the tests. Now, Avram knew well from the verses earlier to call on the name of the Lord. He built the altar, he sacrificed the Lord, he worshiped the Lord. We're going to read in chapter 13, verse 4, that he calls on the name of the Lord. But he doesn't do it till he returns to Bethel, to Beit El, to the house of God. When he's out of the house of God, he's in that, even though he's not physically in that heap of ruin, he is in a heap of ruin. And I just bring it out to encourage each and every one of us, wherever you are, if, you, if you're in the desert or if you're trying to get out of that desert, back to that right place with God, and you're feeling like, how can you ever forgive, forget, move forward, whatever excuse Satan's feeding you, send it back to the pit of hell along with Satan where he belongs in the name of Yeshua, Jesus, because God is, he will, he, he will child chain it. Let's try child train us. <laughs> he will correct us, but he's still, we're still his kid, and he still loves us. Hallelujah for that. So, Avram, you've got a lesson to learn here. This is the first time that Egypt is mentioned in the Word of God, and evidently it was settled by the descendants of Mitzrayim. You probably don't remember the name Mitzrayim because that was all the way back in Genesis chapter 10, verse 6. But Mitzrayim was one of Ham's sons, one of Ham's sons. Remember which line is cursed? Ham's line. It was the line where we don't see the godly influence. The godly influence came through Shem's line. So it seems that Egypt was named after Mitzrayim. That's why it's believed that Ham's uh, son, Mitzrayim, settled here. Because to, to say Hebrew 
to just I'm sorry to say in Hebrew Egypt you say Mitzrayim that's how you say that that's what Mitzrayim means is Egypt so if I confused you forgive me but the idea is it probably was his people who settled this area. They were not a godly people. Egypt is not a godly place. We know that well because of what we see happen um, very soon. Well, not very soon, but it happens in the next book in the Bible is what I'm trying to say. In, in Exodus, we have our people who have been in Egypt for 400 years crying to come out of it. It's not that they went into Egypt with Avram. It's not from that time. There's, there's time in between. But let me just show you, let me put it this way. Egypt in scripture usually is spelling out trouble. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 31 and verse 1. Yeshaya, Isaiah 31, verse 1. Yeshahu, if I'm saying it a little more accurately. And we read in that verse, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses. Trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong. But they do not look to the Holy One of Israel, nor seek the Lord. That's the whole sum of what I'm trying to say. Avram, where are you seeking the Lord? Where are you looking to the Lord? You're putting your eyes on Egypt. Oh, there must be food down there. That's not desert land. That's got the Nile River. You're looking to Egypt to supply your needs. You're not looking to the God of Israel. And every time Israel does that, she gets herself in trouble. When she stays with God, trusts God, looks to God, she stays in a good place. God's blessings are there. And we know as we continue on through Scripture, God even promises uh, the curses that, that were on Egypt would be on Israel if Israel chose to walk away from her God. So she gets warned plenty, but uh, she has to learn just like here Avram's going to have to learn. The Egyptians at this time already, the time that, that, that uh, Avram's even going to go down, were known to be polytheistic, which means they worshiped many gods. They were known to be very cruel. They were known to be very immoral. Polygamy, sexual promiscuity, this was all common. And if you don't believe me, just read Shmot, Exodus chapter 1, where you've got slavery, obvious, and you've got death of babies. What did the babies do wrong? They were born male. They might grow up and be an enemy, so let's just get rid of them. That's a precious life. Can you imagine the horrors of the mamas at that time giving birth, the joy that should be theirs to, well, I won't finish the sentence. But unfortunately, Avram, instead of <coughs> trusting God, it seemed like he was able to trust God for the far-off promises. God told him to go, and he went. He's going through the land, and God's saying, I'm promising to give this to your descendants, and we don't see that Abraham doesn't believe him. But in his upfront personal right now needs, we're seeing that he didn't hold on to the Lord. And so often that's where we trip up is, oh, we need it now. And we have that anxiety issue, and we have the, the concern, and we think we've got to put our hands to it to take care of it. Instead, we need to wait on the Lord and let him direct God, though, in his love and in his faithfulness, because he's faithful even when we are not, bless you, God protected Avram in Egypt. In fact, he even blesses him so that we're going to see Avram's going to come out with more than he goes in with, but it's not always a blessing. He comes out with excess baggage, I'll put it that way. He's going to get a rebuke by a pagan king, He's going to see that harm is going to be in his household the rest of his life and really on down through his, his seed, his progeny, because of what took place in Egypt. If you're not with me, if you haven't read the story and you're not ahead, he picks up a slave girl in this time in Egypt, apparently. This is when Sarai is going to come out with a handmaid. If you're still not with me, I'll spell it out simply, Hagar. This is where she comes in, is she came probably uh, as a slave girl, a mistress to Sarai. She comes out of Egypt with them, and you could think, well, wow, he, got, he picked up more slave people. Well, she's going to be a source of great trouble to Avram's family. And if he hadn't gone down, he wouldn't have picked her up. So, knowing this, let's go ahead and read about the sojourn. He went to sojourn there. 
That means that he didn't go with the intent, I'm going to go buy food and I'm going to come back into Israel. He went with the idea and the intent to live there, to live for a while, probably thinking his flocks need the green grasses and, and so forth, you know, to eat off of also. So he's seeking relief from his difficulties rather than realizing he can profit by his trial. We can profit by our trials. That's why we can say our trials are our blessings. Because if we give them to God and if we stay with God through it, God will bless us in those trials. Maybe not in the way you think it should go, but in a way that is even better for you than what you could have seen and understood. He would have seen God do great things for him. Maybe God would have miraculously fed with manna. We don't know what God would have done. But if God went with him into Egypt, blessed him and brought him out of Egypt safely and back into the promised land, how much more would God have done if he had stayed with him? And uh, furthermore, we see also that even though I say God went with him, that's because God was watching over him. Let me put it that way. Because we don't see Avram build an altar for the Lord in Egypt. Remember, he's built two altars already where he knew the Lord was with him. But in essence, he's moved away from where the Lord is. He's gone down into Egypt. There's no altar there. And he's going to lose far more than he gains by going in, down into Egypt. So it was not a wise move at all. It was not an act of faith. It was a, a moment of weakness in his who he was. The, the uh, what do we call it? not drought, the famine, sorry. The famine was severe and it was grievous. We read that at, at the end of verse 10, depending on your translation, it will either tell you that the famine was severe in the land or it was grievous, it was very severe. So on they go down into Egypt, it came about when he came near to Egypt, so he's almost into Egypt, he turns to Sarai, his wife, and he says, see now, I know you are a beautiful woman. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. And they'll kill me, but they'll let you live. Okay, what's going on here? First of all, um, Sarai is probably in her 60s by now. Now, that's more like, because she's going to live to 127, it's more like, you know, middle age, maybe even more like our 30s, 40s, you know, in there. Um, but still, she's... she's in her 60s, Avram's 10 years older. He's going to live to 175. So even in her middle age, though, she is absolutely beautiful. Somebody says drop dead gorgeous. I'm not sure I like that because drop dead. <laughs> but you get the idea of what's being meant. Now, let me just give you Jewish legend, okay? Notice I'm emphasizing the word legend because this is not true according to scripture, but this gives us the idea of how beautiful it's recorded that Sarai was. The Jewish legend says that when he went down into Egypt, he tried to hide Sarai in a box. When the Egyptian customs officials asked what he had in the box, he said, barley. They said, no, it contains wheat. Okay, Avram says, very well, I'll pay the custom on wheat. Well, then the officers changed their mind and said, no, it's not wheat, it contains pepper. And Avram says, okay, I'll pay the custom charges on pepper. And then the officer said, no, it contains gold. And Avram said, well, I'll pay the custom charges on gold. Whatever you're saying is in there, I'll pay you the custom charges on it. Then the officer said, it contained precious stones. And Avram again says, I'll pay the custom on precious stones. Well, by this time, those officers insisted on opening the box to see what was really in, and it is said that when they did, all of Egypt shined from the beauty of Sarai, that she glorified their whole land with her beauty. And they go on in some of those legends, not all of them, but some of them even compare her in this way. They say, every other woman compared to Sarai, <laughs> forgive me, but it's the way they said it, look like monkeys <laughs> so my point being she must have been oh and that, that, those that say that others look like monkeys also go on and say she was more beautiful than eve <clears throat> okay hello point being she was 
a standout. She was absolutely beautiful. And it was a common practice in that day that if you went down into an area where you're not powerful, which Auburn would be, he's the stranger, that the enemy in that territory very often would kill a husband to get that wife. So Auburn's on his way down for food. He's feeling like he's got to go, but it's kind of hitting him that, uh-oh, this, this is not the best move for me. I'm endangering my life. You are so beautiful, sir. They're going to want you, and they're going to me to get you. So where is his faith? Where is he looking? Where is the God who's promised him a future through his seed? That means he's got to have a wife. And if God's promised it to Avram and Sarai, which Avram believes, then he shouldn't be worried about Sarai or about himself or anything else. If he were in a good place with God, he'd be trusting God. Because remember uh, chapter, the chapter we're in, chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, God told him all those blessings that he would give him. Let me just, just in a glance, you know, um, I'll make you a great nation, I'll bless you, I'll make your name great, you shall be a blessing, I'll bless those who bless you, I'll curse those who curse you, in you all the families of the earth would be blessed. So that was a huge, a lot of promise, but Abram seems to have forgotten about it. I think too often we do the same thing. The Lord has come to us, encouraged us, given us a word, then he, he in essence almost backs up, almost seems like he withdraws his hand just to see how we'll act, how we're going to be in the midst of that test. Are we going to trust him or not? And too often, I think we act like opera. We get all panicky, we get all worried, and we start trying to fix it ourselves. But if we would stay true to the Lord, he has never proven himself unfaithful to anyone <clears throat> through all time. So here again, Avram is going to concoct a scheme on his terms that he thinks is going to keep him out of trouble. So he tells her, I don't want to die. I, I want to live. So please say you're my sister so that it may go well with me because of you and that I might live on account of you. Now, if we take a sneak peek all the way to chapter 20, let's go over there. Go to chapter 20, Genesis chapter 20. In Genesis? Uh, yes, in Genesis. Whoops, whoops, if I can get there with my tablet anyway. Genesis chapter 20. Okay, I got it. Fat fingers today. Genesis chapter 20. Uh, we're going to look at verses 12 and 13. Okay, we're still in Abraham's story in his line. And we're here going to read. This is another time that Abraham's got himself in trouble. Okay? Remember, he's, he's a great man of faith, and I have high respect for him, and I look forward to meeting Abraham. But he was very human. He wasn't something that, you know, we could think, oh, we could never get there. Okay. So, Abram is speaking, and he says about Sarai here, verse 12, Besides, she actually is my sister, the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. And it came about when God caused me to wander from my father's house that I said to her, This is the kindness with which you will show to me. Everywhere we go, say of me, he's my brother. So, Abram does it once in chapter 12. He's going to do the same thing in chapter 20. Does he sound like a human being? Yeah. <laughs> Very fearful one. I, I think we're seeing him real, warts and all. <laughs> so, yeah, a fearful one, too. A fearful one, yes. yes. So back in chapter 12, the first time that he's doing it, what he basically is saying is a half-wife. Now, I want you to see, do we see anywhere in Scripture where God says, oh, that's okay because it's half-true? <laughs> no, we don't see that. He should have been trusting the Lord, and he did not. His intent was to deceive. His intent was to uh, pull the wool over the eyes of those that he thought you know, could harm him. So his intent was not good. A half lie, a half truth is not good. The truth, the whole truth of nothing but the truth, okay? Um, he is going to endanger the honor of the one who's nearest and dearest to him. He probably didn't expect it to go the way it did. Um, I can tell you later in history than this that there was found um, recordings, and in those recordings there was 
uh, an agreement that was made. Uh, well, here, let me just read it to you, okay? It's on ancient Egyptian papyrus. And it related that a pharaoh, on advice of his counselor, set armies to take away a man's wife by force and to murder her husband. So we know it was practiced later, and because Avram was worried about it, it probably was being practiced even in Avram's day. He probably had a right in his human reasoning to expect that. This wasn't like a far-fetched idea is what I'm trying to say. It did happen. We've got record of it after the fact, but it probably did happen earlier. And Avram probably was thinking that he could guard Sarai's honor in, in his mind because if they looked on her as a sister of a mighty man, a mighty chief, because he's coming down with, with you know flocks and herds and, and all, that they'd want to court her hand. They want to you know schmooze with the brother. Uh, much like you see when uh, Jacob goes to get a wife and um, Laban's looking for what's Jacob you know, bringing me. Or let's even just do Isaac and Rebekah. When the servant went to, to choose Rebekah, he had gifts to give to the family. You know? So Avram probably thought there'd be some bribery that would go on. There'd be time for him to find a way to escape. If, the, you know, if there was any danger. So he probably really didn't think he was endangering Sarah, and he was, or Sarai, she's called at this point, and he was protecting himself. So he had a good reason, good intent, but here again, human reasoning and human intent is likely going to get us into the pit. It's likely going to lead us down a slippery slope, and it's likely going to get us into trouble. He needed to cry out to God. He needed to turn to God at any point in time. That's what he needed to do. That's what we need to do. But we'll go on with our story and see what happens because he's trying to make it work. So Sarai, please, don't tell them I'm your wife, I'm your husband. Tell them you're my sister, I'm your brother. So, verse 14, it came about when Abram came into Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. The Hebrew is exceedingly beautiful. Yafe ma'od, ooh wee, she was pleasing to the eyes. She must have been a knockout. She probably would have won Miss Universe if they'd had a, a beauty pageant. She was beautiful, not just in Avram's eyes, but apparently everybody around who saw her. So Pharaoh's officials, verse 15, saw her and praised her to Pharaoh. And uh-oh, the story takes a turn. The plot gets thicker. We've got a bigger problem because the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. Now, that's probably not what Avram was banking on having happen, like I said. He probably expected Sarai to stay with him in his tent, and there might be some bargaining going on because they, you know, they wanted her, and he'd figure a way out before a deal would be consummated. It is interesting in verse 15 uh, when it says that Pharaoh's officials praised her to Pharaoh. That word for praise is the root word of our hallelujah. And it's almost always used of God. In this case, it was used here of her beauty. And I'm not sure what I want to draw from that. I'll let you think on that. But uh, um, it makes me wonder if she had a beauty about her because of the Lord, maybe even. I don't know. But uh, it is interesting. It's, it's the same word. She was a prime candidate to be one of Pharaoh's wives because of her outer beauty. Inner's what matters, we know that. But anyway, it just was an interesting, um, used rarely outside of, of God. And to me, it seems only right to belong to God. But anyway, um, she's taken into Pharaoh's house. That means she was put in the harem. You know, mm -hmm. all the pharaohs, all the kings, all the leaders, they had their women, okay? And uh, probably by this time when they're taking her away, Avram's in so deep, he doesn't know what to say. If he shouts out and says, no, wait, she's my wife, he's sure they'll kill, her on the, kill him on the spot so that they can take her on as planned. So he allows the deception to continue, and it's only going to lead to more problems. Remember, God promised Avram that through him, through his seed, this great nation would come. So he's jeopardizing his whole future. He's jeopardizing the seed that would come, the promise of God. It's like almost as soon as God gave him the promise, he does what he can to thwart it, to ruin it, 
whether he meant to or not, he, that's what he's playing with. So, what's going to happen, Oybe? <laughs> God's always in control, and God's at work, and God, even in our mistakes, God will take care of things right us in our mistakes, but like I say, sometimes there's consequences that we pay. Verse 16, Therefore he, meaning Pharaoh, he treated Avram well for her sake, and gave him sheep and oxen and donkeys and male and female servants, hello, male and female servants, and female donkeys and camels. Wow, okay. The Pharaoh showed Avram great favor. He's figuring, oh, you're going to be my brother-in-law. Here, let me give you some of our wealth, you know, so you'll want to be a part of this family. And all it's doing is getting Avram in deeper and deeper because we know where this is going to lead. But he gives him camels, he gives him um, donkeys, the slaves, all of this. And uh, the Hebrew indicated that that Avram got more wealthy is the way that it's being said in Hebrew. So it wasn't that Avram was lacking, but now he's got even more. And among the even more, the female servants, among them, we are quite sure because we know of no other time when Hagar would have been picked up because she was Egyptian. So this is probably when he got her. And all I can say about that is troubles brewing. There is more trouble coming. Uh-oh. So what's God going to do now? Is he going to allow his planned intent to be thwarted? No. No. We can't ever ruin God's plan. Does God ever say anywhere in Scripture from Bereshit to Revelation, Oh, and so here was plan B. <laughs> no. God doesn't even make plan B. He's got plan A, and it's all the way through. So God's going to take care of the problem, but let's read and see what he does. Well, he strikes Pharaoh and his house. It says, but the Lord struck Pharaoh and his house, verse 17, with great plagues because of Sarai, Avram's wife. Okay, God is not going to deny himself because Avram is not doing what he's supposed to do. Go with me, side note, to 2 Timothy, whoops, chapter 2 and verse 13. 2 Timothy, chapter 2 and verse 13, because if God's going to put our mistakes down in Scripture for everybody to read thousands of years later, we need to be learning from those. It's not put there to just be an embarrassment to Avram, it's for us to learn. Chapter um, 2, verse 13 of 2 Timothy, if we are faithless, that's where Avram is at this point. He was faithless. He was not acting in his faith. He, God, remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. That Shaul Paul is, is teaching Timothy, his, his son in the faith, and that Timothy is to pass down these lessons, to pass down these lessons, to come down to us today and beyond us. And what are we to learn? The faithfulness of God. It is not dependent on us, and I say hallelujah. That, does that mean, oh, then fine, just go ahead and do it. anything you want. Don't worry about it. Of course not. If we want to please our God, if we want to be blessed by Him, we need to stay in fellowship with Him. We need to stay right by Him. But if you ever hear the lie from Satan, well, you blew it. God can't fix it now. Or you blew it. You're going to miss out on that whole thing because... Now you took God's word and you, you, you made God's word a lie. No, God will never lie. His word will be what stands. He will write the situation. If your boat's upside down, he'll write it back up. But that doesn't mean that, they're, that, uh, that you get off free either. So, with the house of Pharaoh, Pharaoh sorry, I can't talk today, has great plagues that have been... Um, happening since Sarai came into his harem. And the Egyptians, um, being very superstitious, they would have thought these plagues were a judgment of a god. They're not realizing that they're a judgment of the god. But they would have, uh, you know, when they had bad weather, they hadn't appeased the sun god or the moon god or, you know, the, the whatever god it was showing his anger. That's how the Egyptians would have um, looked at it. Now God is showing us 
his faithfulness in spite of us. He's going to be faithful to that unconditional promise. He's not going to allow Avram's lack and Avram's sin to squelch it. But notice consequences are now falling on others also. Pharaoh's house is suffering because Avram didn't stay right with the Lord and trust and have faith. Yes, Rhonda. I know that you're on 2 Timothy, but I wasn't sure where you were before that when we were talking about Sarah. And I, was, I was trying to find where you were. The scripture I gave before, 2 Timothy 2.13 is when we just, oh, when she was the sister, the half-truth. Right. That's Genesis 20, verses 12 and 13. Oh, that's where I was. <laughs> Try it again. You should find it there. Yeah, Genesis 20, verses 12 and 13, where he does the same thing again, but explains it a little more in well, detail. The part where you're saying Pharaoh uh, took her, that, that part. Oh, I was back in, in chapter 12, the, she, when she was taken into Pharaoh's house, chapter 12, verse 15. Okay. I went back to where we were. I'm sorry. Okay. So, yeah. no, that's okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. Sure. Pharaoh took her into his house, into his harem, basically. He gives Avram, you know, all this reward for her. Um, he's, he's schmoozing with, with Avram, you know, let's, let's be nice, let's like each other. And God says, mm, uh -uh, I'm not pleased, and it puts plagues on Pharaoh's house. So the Egyptians, in their superstition, are realizing, uh-oh, something is wrong here. Now, we don't know anything more than this. We don't know if God spoke to Pharaoh. I tend to think not, because at other times when God spoke to another king, you know, a leader or somebody like that, we do know God did. Um, we don't know if he just started seeking for a reason for the plagues. Maybe he started putting two and two together. Hmm, I didn't have, the land didn't have this kind of trouble until that foreign woman was brought into this house. Maybe he even talked to Sarai, or maybe even to Avram, or, or well not Avram because we know Avram hasn't owned up to it. Maybe even Lot, we don't know, we don't know how, but I tend to think it was more just, um, he put two and two together, wow. You know, I didn't have trouble till this one showed up. If you've ever had experience with somebody who's not in a good place spiritually, in your life and you've seen the trouble around it. I kind of feel like it's pig pen in Linus, uh, in uh, Charlie Brown, you know, what's that, the whole series, you know, pig pen, you just see all the dirt, you know, wherever he goes, he's stirred up that dirt and he's taking it with him. I kind of think it, it was like that is, the Pharaoh realized these gods, you know, because he's looking to the gods, he's not looking to the true God. He doesn't know the true, the one true and living God. So he thinks these gods are upset, and they are upset the same time that Sarai came in. You know, there must be something connected with her. Whatever, all we know is that this Pharaoh figures out that's the hot spot. That's the problem. I need to do something about this problem. So the Pharaoh in verse 18 calls Avram and said, What have you done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Oh, okay, wait a minute. He did get some intel from somewhere. This is more than just putting two and two together because the gods are not alive. The gods aren't able to tell him. And I do not believe that Satan came to him and said, That's his wife. <clears throat> But I think he may have gone prodding. And either Sarah let it leak or Lot let it leak, but somebody let the cat out of the bag. Somebody said, yeah, there's a problem because she's his wife. She's not free for you to take her into your harem. Well, couldn't he, as, as being Pharaoh, he knew, knows the laws and knows what's going on. He knew that people have been past times taken, that killed the husband and kept the wife. You know, so couldn't they, he thought that he's maybe pulling the wool over his eyes by making a sister and not... I'm sure he figured, you told me she was your sister so that I wouldn't kill you. Yeah. I'm sure he figured that out, but he wouldn't figure that out till he knew she was his wife and yeah. not just his sister. Yeah, but so, did God visit the king and warn him about the woman? Not here in this one. We, we know later we see that. Now, it could have happened. God could have been the one who revealed it to him. 
we just don't read about it, so we don't know. But in some way, he got down to the truth. Yeah. I think if God had been the source, I think we would be reading about it. So I tend to think more, I, I have a feeling he called Sarai in. That's what I really think. And I think he started pressuring her, and I think she crumbled. <laughs> and rightfully so. She's, she's scared. She's, she's where she knows she doesn't belong. She's, she had to be in fear in the harem. What if he called her up? And if you don't know what I mean, stay tuned. We'll talk about that in a moment, okay? She had been in a lot of fear. If she had an opportunity excuse me, to cop out, I'm not so sure she wouldn't have. You know, at the same time, she's gone along with a lie, thinking she doesn't want to be the cause of her husband's death. But somewhere, somehow, God got the truth to this Pharaoh. And he's, he's mad. He's <laughs> upset. He, is, he did not take it easy. And he goes right to, to Avram. What have you done to me? Why have you brought this evil on my house? Is basically what well, he's saying. Well, in verse 17, it talks about the Lord plagued Pharaoh and yes. his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Right, right. So he had to figure that out. Except I think initially, because they worshipped all the gods, if the plagues were in the, in the weather, if the plagues were in the land, whatever it was, they looked to those gods initially. And those gods don't have any wisdom and ability to speak and to talk and to tell Pharaoh what's going on. So the plagues caused Pharaoh to realize there's a problem. Pharaoh says, I've got a problem. i got to get to the source. And he starts looking and he's thinking, okay, she came in, plagues came in. Let me talk to her. You know, call her up here. Get her here. <laughs> well, 18, it talks about that Pharaoh called Abram. Right. He said, what is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? So I think he just automatically just called Abram and wanted to find out but why how, he was. how did he know that she was his wife? See, that's the question. How did he know? How did Pharaoh know Sarah was wife, not, not just sister? How did he know? I think it's because when all the plagues started, it's immediately when he was thinking of Sarah, I think immediately, you know, he was not dumb. He realized it's still it was put it together before until she stepped in. So he realized that, that that's the source of the problem, but that still wouldn't have told him why it was a problem. Somewhere along the line, I think he had to have gotten some more information. Could it have come from the other women in the in the Yes, the Sarah, you know, Sarah, be could friends have, with her and find out, you know. True, like Patty said, maybe he talked to the other women in the harem because maybe Sarai found one that was friendly and confided in her and maybe Sarah, the Pharaoh had even said, try to talk to her, try to see if there's something that you can find out. Being as superstitious as they were, they were looking mm -hmm. for it to be some sort of god that they needed to appease, but why? So maybe find out about her gods find out who they they worship you know what's going on we just don't know the reason why i'm opening it up to you to think is because i want this to not just be the same story you've read a hundred times and you're not thinking i want you to realize you know these are real people with real situations we may have something going on in our life and we might make the same mistake and look to others to help us understand we need to look to god and God will enlighten us for whatever we need to know. Pharaoh needed to know, hey, don't touch her. Okay? We're going to see Pharaoh, that God kept Pharaoh from touching her. Because, is it, um, is it here? Because um, I read somewhere yeah. there that uh, um, in that vision when God showed or, or scared Pharaoh, it showed that do not touch her. Okay, but don't mix it up with the other story. This story here, not chapter 20. This story oh, okay. here, all that we're told is the plague struck the house, okay. struck the land, okay? Struck Pharaoh and his house. So actually, it shouldn't even say the land. It struck Pharaoh and his house. But he does find out she's his wife, and she, he says in verse 19, Why did you say she's my sister so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here's your wife. Take her and go. Okay. Is it surprising so, that he didn't kill him? I think it's the hand of God. 
Yeah, because you know God had His hand upon Abraham. Exactly. So there's no way He had that thought, because that vision, He had a vision. He doesn't of, tell us He had a vision. Yeah, totally, but yeah. He still, you know, God still. God is in control. Yeah. And this still, is what I'm trying to show us. God's in control. Abram stepped in that bed. He sends his wife down into a position where she can be compromised, where the promise can be broken, but God says, no, I am faithful. I gave that promise. I'm not going to let anything happen. So he doesn't let Pharaoh take her into himself. He sends plagues, and he, he, he kept Pharaoh from calling her the first night because we don't know how many nights she spent in the harem. But he kept Pharaoh from calling her and forcing himself on her because Sarai wouldn't have been able to stop him. And he saw to it that the truth came out. And when the truth came out, Pharaoh's livid. Take her, get out of here. And then even says in verse 20, I'm going to come back to a couple of things in here. Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him. They escorted him away with his wife and all that belonged to him. So Pharaoh didn't say, give me back all my stuff. Pharaoh went ahead and sent Avram off with the camels and the donkeys and the maidservants and the, the, the male servants and all. But the way it says, I think basically, they escorted him to the border of Egypt and Israel. <laughs> We're not going to let you stop. We're not going to let you, you know, do anything else here in the land. We want you out of our land. You are nothing but trouble. Go. And then he told his men, make sure he goes, you know. I and I the think plague, they escorted him all the way to the, I think the border. The plagues put enough fear in him that he wanted them out of Oh, absolutely. Place. Absolutely, the, the plagues mm -hmm. did. But notice, it's a heathen king that's rebuking the one that's to be the man of God. That's sad. But our sins will rebuke us. We will not get away with our sins, our failures. When we don't trust the Lord, we're going to be rebuked whether it's by a heathen king or whoever it's by, the Lord is going to pull us up short. It would have been better for Avram if he would have even been hungry in the land that God showed him and stayed there with God, and even if it had been lean times and not, you know, if Avram was used to fluency. He was used to having, you know, a lot. Even if he had gone through a time that taught him humbleness in, in his surroundings, it still would have been better than going down into the luxuries of Egypt. And for us, that's the world. It's better if we're lean and, and I can't say lean and mean, <laughs> but better for us to be lean in the house of the Lord than to enjoy the luxuries of the world around us. And in spite of it, in spite of Egypt and, and all, God kept his hand on God's plan. And he brought Avram out, he brought Sarai out safely. But can you imagine how much more blessing, the lessons, whatever all Avram would have learned had he stayed and trusted? What would he have seen the hand of God do? do and you know? I was just going to say, is that where, what a web we... We weave when at first we try to deceive. I think also <laughs> with him being human and newly as a Christian, of accepting, because God is a spirit, Man is used to seeing, seeing, but with God, you don't see, you got to believe, and so I think he, was, he had to learn along the way. Absolutely. He was a work in progress. Yes. Absolutely. Are we a work in progress? Yes. Absolutely. The proverb, pride goes before the fall? Absolutely. We, we need to realize and never become so confident that we're not leaning on the Lord. Trust the Lord in all your ways. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. He will direct your paths. That's definitely lessons that we can learn from this. Um, we, we learn the faithfulness of God in it. Hallelujah. But not for us to take advantage of that. For us to be thankful for it. To be thankful for mercy. Because God's mercy is shown. <coughs> Avram could have been killed. He could have been stripped of everything. But Pharaoh apparently had enough fear or enough respect for Avram's God that he didn't, you know, he, he, he stopped short of what he could have done. And in essence, we're seeing the blessing that God promised on Avram already there. That God would bless um, Avram. And we're seeing it because he was blessed that he got mercy from the Pharaoh. I also think that, you know, Pharaoh uh, at that time didn't understand but what he felt and all that. He, he realized that 
killing never entered his mind because he didn't know if this would have produced more problems. They could have been worried about that, that if the gods, if Avram's god or gods were this upset, if he did worse to Avram, they'd do even worse to him and his yeah, household. Fear it him. could be what God used in Pharaoh's mind. Because he controls the heart and he can make that person think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So at any rate, Avram, we don't see say anything back. He is just mute. You ever been in a position where you called up short and you know, mm, you just I need to, to yeah, you just need to own it. You need to learn it. And of course, he needed it to go to God for forgiveness, you know, and turn back to God. But I think his very silence was acknowledging his guilt. Like you're saying, he knew. He knew he'd stepped in it. He knew he'd done wrong. This time, when he does this, He's in Egypt. He's where he shouldn't have even been. The next time he does it in chapter 20, we'll see he's in Gerar. He's on his way down toward Egypt. He's not even out of the land yet when he waffles. But again, God remains faithful. I do not encourage any of us to waffle, but I thank God for his, his faithfulness. It is not dependent on us. It's dependent on God. So yeah, The 13th chapter even talks about leaving Egypt and how he learned. And we're going to go there. We're going to look at a little bit before we go into it because Abram went into Egypt to escape the famine in the land of, of Canaan, <laughs> the land of Canaan. Okay, okay, you're going to slide because it's not the, the other side of this is the hole he gets in, so he'll figure it out. Okay, notice now, I want to take you to the parallelism of the sojourn of Abram into Egypt and later the children of Israel going into Egypt, okay? It's so similar. I want to say, Israel, why didn't you learn from Avram, from his mistake? But it's, it's, again, the same to us. Let us learn from their mistakes that we don't do them. So, here in chapter 12 and verse 10, we saw it was a famine that led them to go down into Egypt. Now go with me to chapter 47, Genesis 47. And we're going to see the same reason is what took them into Egypt here. Chapter 47 and verse 13, we're now in the time of Yosef, of Joseph. We've got Avram, Yitzhak, Yaakov, Yosef. So we're down to the great-grandson of Avram. Who is, who, who is in the land of Egypt. We know he got sold into slavery. Um, that's how he ended up in Egypt. But in chapter 47, verse 13, it says, speaking about um, Israel. Now there was no food in all the land because the famine was very severe. Doesn't that sound like what we read in chapter 12? So we've got something similar. So the, that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished because of the famine. So the famine's gone on, even, even down there. It's not great, but it's better in Egypt. They are here, there's food in Egypt. Why? Because God gave that wisdom to Yosef. He, he um, um, not gleaned, you know, he had him bring in the food, stored the food in the seven years of plenty so that they were ready for the seven years of famine. But notice the similarity. It was a famine, it's severe in the land, that took them out of the land of Israel both times with Avram and when they go down into Egypt um, the, with, uh, in the time when Joseph was down there. Um, again, the, they went down to sojourn. They went down to, to, to stay, to, to you know, get through the famine. They weren't going down with intent of coming right back, okay? When they go down with in Yosef's day, the only difference there is God was with them initially, because when they went down to stay, this is after Joseph has revealed himself to his brethren, he's told them, go get dad, bring him down, stay here, we'll set you up here, you know, um, you'll live well down here. So, chapter 47 that we were in, go down to verse 27, and it has now Israel lived in the land of Egypt, and that's Israel, Jacob Israel lived in the land of Egypt in Goshen, and they acquired property in it and were fruitful and became very numerous. So if you remember from the backdrop of Exodus, of Shemot, of the um, Exodus out of Egypt, there were like two and a half million that came out of Egypt, but when they went down into Egypt, remember they were less than 75, 70 to 75 in number that went down into Egypt. 
because the famine was so severe that they were about to be wiped out. If you've got a nation that's down to 70, 75 people, you're, you're much in danger of becoming an endangered species. <laughs> I'll put it that way. So they both went down because of famine, and they both went down with the intent to stay for a time in Egypt. We also see the attempt to kill the males, but save the females. Okay, Avram worried about that. They'll kill me, but they'll let Sarai live because they'll they because she was beautiful. And in chapter one uh, of Exodus of Shemot, verse twenty-two. We have the command to go out to kill all the male children because remember, well, let's look at it um, because I think it says it in that one verse. So if are it we doesn't, with Abraham or are we with Joseph now? From we're seeing the comparison between what Avram did and the, the children of Israel. Okay, in Exodus, it's the children of Israel, chapter one. And verse 22, it says, And Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born to you, you're to cast into the Nile. Every daughter, you're to keep alive. Sarah will keep you alive. Avram will kill you. If we kill off the male children, their, their numbers will not keep increasing. They won't be more than us and more powerful than us. And if they side with the enemy, we're dead. So, again, it's just following a similarity. What Avram did with Sarai to protect himself, we see the children of Israel do as a as a group when they went down to Egypt and we see they get treated the same way in Egypt. Egypt is not the place where God is and where he would have his people. We saw it both times. Remember and we just read it, Loretta even brought it out again. Plagues were brought on the house of Pharaoh. What happens in Exodus leading up to the children of Israel finally being released in the story of Passover that, that we do every year. It's the plagues. Remember, there were ten plagues, the final being the, the death of the firstborn. So we see plagues on both. We saw it in verse 17 here in chapter 12, and you read about the plagues from Exodus chapter 7. Start with about, about verse 14 and go all the way through chapter 11, verse 10, to get to that tenth plague. Now, it also is interesting that both come out of Egypt with the spoils of Egypt. The spoils not mean, oh, that's rotten, but meaning they get the spoils of war. They came out with booty. They came out with great wealth. In Genesis 12, 16, we see all that, that this Pharaoh gave to Avram, the donkeys and the camels and the servants, you know, and all that was said. And in Exodus chapter 12, if you're still at one, it's easy to flip over to chapter 12. If not, I'll read it for you. In chapter 12, verses 35 and 36, this is after the 10th plague. This is when um, they're, they're being released. It says, Now the sons of Israel had done according to the word of Moshe, of Moses, for they had requested from the Egyptians articles of silver, articles of gold, and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let him have their requests. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. What happened? God is fair and God is just. They had worked for 400 years as slaves. Okay? They had been, it, when you're a slave, you don't get the, the wealth that's due you. You work for a mere pittance. You work for a bowl of, of, of soup. soup, something that, that will just keep you alive enough to work the next day. And God, in essence, said, okay, Egypt, you owe my people their hire. So he sends them out with all the wealth of Egypt, the gold and the silver and, and all that, that Egypt had, clothing. Well, what did God plan in advance? What did God know? That gold and that silver is going to go right into the making of the tabernacle. That's after we get past the golden calf, which gets melted down, okay? But we see it go into that. And what about that clothing? Remember, they're going to go 40 years in the wilderness and their clothing doesn't wear out. <laughs> when they get their clothing, <laughs> it must have been pretty out. good. Yeah, they carried out. They wore it out. So I just kind of chuckle, and I just see God saying, well, you know, you thought you got free slave labor, Pharaoh? No, you didn't. Now you can pay my children everything you owe them all at once and send them out with great wealth. So, again, just a comparison between the two. Now, the deliverance we see in chapter 12 and verse 19, we see that Pharaoh told Avram, Get out, go, and escorts them out of his land. 
Well, we have the deliverance. It starts in chapter 12. I think we read a couple of the verses, uh, yeah, where they just now came out with the clothing. We start with about verse 31. He called for Moshe and Aaron at night, said, Rise up, get out from among my people, both of you, the sons of Israel, go. Worship the Lord, as you said. Take your flocks, take your herds, go, go, and bless me also. So Pharaoh, until he changes his mind, you know, because we know he did, he tells him to go. Pharaoh, in chapter 12, where we're studying, told Abram and escorted him out. And when you get all the way to Exodus chapter 15, this is what's called the Song of Moshe. A lot of you know that song, Horse and Rider Thrown into the Sea, and it's the victory song of celebration because God brought them out of Egypt, opened up the Red Sea, brought them through on dry land, then brought the waters down on the Egyptian army and drowned them so that they saw it no more ever, the Egyptian army after them. So God gave them miraculous deliverance with um, the spoils. And then we see finally the ascent. Remember this was all descent down into Egypt. Now is the ascent. They're going back up. They're going into the Negev again. And they're going to go back into where they're going to be where God wanted them to be. Um, go back to Genesis 13. We'll just, just barely look ahead. Chapter 13 and verse 1. So how many pharaohs from Abram to Joseph? All I know is it says that in Joseph's time that the, the Pharaoh arose that knew not the, the people. And we know that um, the Pharaohs changed um, dynasty. I think it's the way I can say it. Mm -hmm. So that, that there was this whole new regime that took over that didn't know and so they didn't treat Israel favorably because they didn't know that Israel was um, kind toward them. Um, I think it probably was a number. I'd have to go through and see how many are listed in history, but I think it was quite a number because you have 400 years. You have a long time, you know, where there was a, a number of turnovers. But I, especially when they changed, I think they were called the Hicksucks at first, and then there's another, or they became the Hicksucks. I don't remember, but there's there's one that um, um, I'm, I'm, I don't want to say because I don't want to say anything I'm not confident of. But we can go into history, we can, if you're Googling it, you'll get an answer <laughs> right mm -hmm. there. Uh, but it was a number of pharaohs later. It wasn't just the next pharaoh that rose up. Time went on, things changed. Uh, we can see that in our own political worlds, that mm -hmm. as leadership changes, sometimes it is as close as a father to a son, and there's a lot of similarity, but then in time, you've gotten way off into this other, you know, and it's, it's a whole different world. Dora, did you have something to add? Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> I thought you did. I didn't want to catch you off. Um, what I'm seeing here in this parallel is God's acting out Israel's future, Israel's deliverance in Avram. They, if they would have seen how God brought Avram out, maybe it would have encouraged them when they were in slavery also that God would bring them out. For us, it definitely looks like a prophetic picture, and we'll see that on a greater scale, and we'll hold on to that. The same way God didn't allow Israel to come to an end in Egypt, Israel didn't allow, I mean, God, I'm sorry, God did not allow Israel to come to an end at any other time in history. And Israel is about to face her worst time in all of history, during the tribulation period when literally all the nations of the world will come against her, when she will be standing alone, when she will be in dire straits, when all she will have is her God to defend her, and he will, because he promised, because he is faithful, not because Israel is doing right. She's down in Egypt. She's in rebellion. She's not in that right fellowship, but God's going to be faithful. And we can look at Israel, we can tell Israel, we've read the final chapter, you will win. God is on your side. He will bring you out. But the ones who will get to enjoy those spoils of war, the ones who will get to go into that victory, are only going to be the ones that are right with God. The rest are going to be being killed off, martyred, killed, etc., etc., during that time. So that finally, that little sliver that, that cries out and says, Baruch Abba Hashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're the ones that are in faith believing and move into the millennial kingdom and receive those promises that God has given to Israel that have yet to be fulfilled. So it's just like a small picture, 
a little bigger picture and the greater picture yet to come. That where God was faithful here, where God was faithful here, God will be faithful there. And Israel's going to need to know that and hold on to that, the believers in the land during the tribulation period. Because uh, unless they end up losing the life of martyrdom, and a great majority will, um, they're, you know, the ones who survive are going to need to cling to God and His faithfulness. Uh, it's going to look so dark. You know, they're not going to have support and help anywhere. It, it just, wow, what a time. So I think God's put this in Scripture for, a, for a, many a period of time. And in our personal lives also, always. So if there aren't any more questions, I think we're ready for Chapter 13. Or comments. Questions or comments. Okay, lot to learn. I'm sorry, Avram, that you had to go through some tough times, but I'm thankful, Avram, because of what we can learn from it. So, Avram's going to return to the place where he left God's promises. I encourage you, if you ever know you are out in that desert, turn and go back to the place where God's promises are. Lot goes back with him, though. Lot's going to go back into the land of promise. Then Lot's going to separate from Avram and go to Sodom. After that happens, that's when God appears to Avram for the third time. He does not appear to Avram until Avram is alone. We'll say more about that as we come to it, but that's key. As long as he was in the land of Egypt, as long as he was holding on to Lot, God doesn't appear to him. God keeps his hand on him. God brings him through. He hits some hard knocks, but he does not see God and have that fellowship with God, that face-to-face -face with God, till he gets it right with God. So, chapter 13 and verse 1, Avram went up from Egypt to the Negev, he and his wife and all that belonged to him. I wish I could put a period there. And Lot went with them. Why do I say that? What's wrong with Lot? That's his nephew. <laughs> but do you remember? I don't what? understand why you know, Lot didn't learn from his uncle. Why didn't he? <laughs> why didn't uh, Abram talk to Lot? You know, why plant did, the seed. Why didn't Lot open his own eyes and see? <laughs> why don't any of us learn? And that's <laughs> where I was going next. You just cut me off at the past. <laughs> but it shows but, Abram yeah. never really witnessed. Our minister to lot. Mm. We don't. We can't say that. Oh, okay. Have you ever witnessed to somebody? Really tried to tell them, show them, laid it on the line, mm -hmm. and they've walked away from your spiritual advice. Okay. Yeah. So I don't know which way it is. I hope that Avram did. You know, I hope he did. If he never would have gotten all that trouble, I don't think if he would have. If he would have listened in the first place yeah. to God, God said, leave your family and go. Why did God do that? Was God mean to the rest of the family? You know, if, if you think, and I'll personalize it, and I'll say, I've got a nephew. Uh, that, I've got two nephews. They are both near and dear to my heart. If God said, get up and leave your family, don't take them with you, yes, I'd have a hard time. But here's the difference. Avram wasn't being told to leave something near and dear to his heart and, and, you know, it wasn't good for them. Lot, as we're going to see from how his character is, was not a God-fearer. He was not one in fellowship with God and he's not going to learn to be. We're going to see that. He just continues with problems. Now, it doesn't mean that Lot, okay, I'll just say it. It doesn't mean that Lot went to hell. Okay, I, he didn't because he gets called righteous. So at some point, Lot does give his life to the Lord, but most of what we see in Scripture about Lot, he's not walking with the Lord. When God told Abram to separate, so often, if a Christian walks with a non-Christian, the path that goes down is in the direction of the non-Christian. It's not in the direction of the Christian. You would think it would be opposite. You would think the Christian would pull that non-Christian up. But more times than not, and I'm not going to put a number on it, but if I did, I'd probably say 9,999 out of 10,000 times. You're going to see the Christian compromise. You're going to see them pulled down. God is, is birthing in Avram, leading him to grow in him in a way that he had to leave the gods behind. 
What gets the children of Israel into trouble every time? The false gods. They bring them in. They brought them in. Solomon brought them in with all of his wives. They've made altars to them in the land of Israel. So there's little places all over of worship to the false gods. And if you don't think that there's corruption and that there's evil powers in those areas and with those, let me tell you there is. If you ever get near those areas as a strong Christian, you will feel the spiritual warfare there. You know it's, it's bad. What God was telling Avram was to separate from idolatry, separate from evil, separate from what is not going to walk with me. And that was his family. Avram was to come out alone. Now, God let Avram compromise and bring Lot along. And as I said, I do believe that Lot does at a point because he's called righteous later. And we'll see that as we study him. He does get right with God at some point, And I think it was Avram's influence. I don't see any other way where he would have. But unfortunately, Lot is going to represent the world. And Lot's going to pull him down every time. That's why God's not even speaking to him in the fullness in the way that he does when he finally is separate from Lot. Can I ask one question? If a person, uh, um, let's just say, has an idol because it looks cute, <laughs> and he just w and he wants to set it up in his yard, that's still wrong, isn't it? Absolutely, it's still wrong. There's nothing cute about an idol. And if you have eyes to think it's cute, I will encourage you to get your eyes on the Word of God and on true spiritual, and you will not find anything cute in that idol. Sam's you will not daughter, find anything. I turned on that and last I don't, that pot belt, no. Yeah, no. And it's not innocent. It's not just sitting there doing nothing. It is a tool that Satan works through and, mm -hmm. and works with. Not that it has power. Idols don't have power. But the God they represent does have power who will try to trip up believers. So no, a believer should have nothing to do with those type of influences on the properties in their homes, that sort of thing. No, you need to turn completely away from it. So, comment, question? Okay, I keep thinking I'm cutting off this side. <laughs> I don't know why, but I see something and then I miss it. But um, um, I think Avram had a soft heart for Lot. Lot either wanted to go or maybe Avram felt like he needed to take him because of being the uncle, the one to help him. I don't know. I can't say why, but I just know it wasn't God's plan and it does spell trouble. So, um, is it possible that Lot just wanted to go with his uncle and his favorite uncle? He it, just wanted to go with him? It could be possible that Lot liked Avram's wealth. Oh, you know, I like being around Uncle Ob. <laughs> <laughs> he's got you know all kinds I mean we eat good when we're with him you know it could be that he had his eyes on all the worldly possessions because we're going to see possessions right here in this next verse so I can't say why but I know Lot didn't have the heart for the Lord that Avram had and, yeah. and of course God instilled that and called Avram and he responded but we do see They've all come up out of Egypt, and it says, verse 2, Now Avram was very rich in livestock, in silver and in gold. We know he had some of this before he went into Egypt. We know he came out with it. And this is, is good and is bad because we're going to see that it's going to cause strife between Avram and Lot. The strife's going to be over their possessions. If you don't know, there's going to be a time when, when it's said there, there's not enough land here for both of ours, you know, that, that it's going to be a problem. Um, there's also going to be strife between Sarai and Hagar, the Egyptian maid that, that he obtained. We'll see that in chapter 16. We'll see that in chapter 21. So what you're seeing pretty much is the principle of sowing and reaping, where Avram sowed a few seeds he shouldn't have sown. He's going to reap some trouble. He's not going to get off scot-free, and it doesn't matter. And by the way, if you have the word cattle in, uh, in your version, because you've got the King James, that means livestock. And so when I read rich in livestock, you may have rich in cattle. Just don't want to confuse you. But we're going to see from verse 3 that Avram returns to fellowship with the Lord. Remember, he got it right when he did turn away. When he does, he owns up to it. He doesn't make excuse for himself. He doesn't try to say to, to the Pharaoh, you know, any reason. He doesn't even say, well, I was afraid, which is the truth. But he just shuts up and takes the rebuke. And then he returns. <coughs> That's his right step. 
he turns back to go to have that fellowship with the Lord restored. And by divine grace, it is restored. Now, Abraham, Avram, who becomes Abraham, he's going to be harassed all the rest of his days by what took place during his time of backsliding. He's going to have the consequences, but God is still, by grace, going to restore fellowship and bring him back. So, he comes back, he went on his journeys from the Negev as far as, and nowhere, notice where he goes, Bethel, Beit El, to the house of God. He knew where to go back, he went back to where he got off the path with the Lord. He went back to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, Ai. Okay, so he didn't go back to the heap of ruin. He didn't go halfway. He didn't go half-hearted. He goes all the way back to where the, he had had an altar where he had um, met the Lord or the Lord had met him. And verse 4 tells us that, to the place of the altar which he had made there formerly, and there Avram called on the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. He's getting it right. We read that in chapter 12, verse 8, when he was there the first time. He goes off into the world. He gets, <coughs> he gets um, knocked around by the world, so to speak. He gets brought out by divine grace, and he goes back to the house of the Lord and goes to that altar where he first had it right with the Lord. So now he's back on track doing what he should be doing, but again, there's still going to be consequences that come from it. So, verse 5. Now Lot, who went with Avram, also had flocks and herds and tents. So Lot apparently gained wealth in Egypt also. And what we're going to see, the difference between Lot and Avram, is Lot's wealth possessed him. He, 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 I think that just says it, okay? Avram had great possessions, but they didn't possess him. You can have great possessions and they don't possess you, or you can have great possessions and they do possess you. And sometimes people have such great possessions that they have to work to death to provide for those possessions, to hold on to those possessions, and in their working to death, oh, I don't have time to go to church. Oh, I don't have time to do that for the Lord. I don't have time to do this or do that. I'm so busy just taking care of all the things that I've got. You can see the traps that are there. So having a whole lot of wealth, it, if it's possessing you, it's not doing it's you any favor. Dis uh, distractions. Yes, it's distractions. And Lot's very much distracted by his wealth. Avram apparently is learning lessons, and we do see a bit of improvement with Avram here. But because Lot had a lot, Avram had a lot, we've got a problem. Verse 6, the land could not sustain them, sustain or bear them. It couldn't... They, it, it couldn't take care of all the crops and everything that, that needed to be, I mean, all the cattle and everything, you know, they all needed to eat, they all needed their space, and the land was not enough. It could not sustain them while dwelling together, for their possessions were so great, they were not able to remain together. So we're going to see that, that there's got to be a dividing of the way here. Um, when it says possessions, or you may have the word sustenance, the idea in the Hebrew is this is movable property. So the things that can be moved, herds can be moved, sheep can be moved. These things are what they're going to have to figure out what to do because there's not enough land. Now, there is a lot of land here, but it was not just open and free, no one else there. The Canaanites were there, the Perizzites occupied the best of the land, verse 7 tells us that. There was strife between the herdsmen of Avram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. So we know it's the ones taking care of their, their cattle and their sheep that are fighting, okay? But it says now the Canaanite and the Perizzite were dwelling then in the land, okay? So, uh, and later, by the way, that the word sustaining here, or the, um, is it sustaining? Uh, Yes, the word sustaining, the, the land could not sustain them. That's going to take on a legal um, type of, uh, oh, how am I, I'm sorry, I'm saying this so poorly. In my mind, I had it better last night when I was studying it. In time, property gets deeds and, and that sort of thing. That's what's going to come from this, who it belongs to, that sort of thing. But right now, and that opens up to a lot of legal controversy. Also, it's still in the land of Israel today when those try to say, oh, well, our ancestors were here first, so it's our land. And then they say, no, our ancestors were here as our land. 
controversy goes on. We just see the roots of it all the way back here. There's strife, there's contention. The Perizzites, by the way, were a, a tribe of the Canaanites, Canaanites. Um, they were known to live in open country. And uh, they're mentioned at the time of Yaakov, Jacob. They're mentioned at the time of Yahshua, Joshua's death. They're even mentioned at the time of Shlomo, of Solomon. So they were uh, no doubt a strong tribe, a large tribe, a lot of people to deal with. So they probably had a lot of livestock. Now you've got Avram with a lot of livestock and you've got Lot with a lot of livestock. You can see what's happening. You know, what, what used to be just all the Canaanites and the Perizzites, now they're having to share with Avram and Lot. Now God's the one that said they were to go to that land. God's the one that brought Avram to the land and we're going to see God's going to say, it is for you and your your um, ancestors, your, not ancestors, your descendants. Um, we're going to see that God says he's going to cast the others out of the land because of their idolatry, because of their unfaithfulness, because they were so bad, They're, they were so evil that God's going to take away from them even what they do have and give that land to the people that are going to be the people of his name, the people, his chosen people. So it's what, it's what God ordained is what I'm trying to say. But here we've got our roots of problems right from the beginning. And now in the midst of the Canaanites who are idol worshipers, here comes Avram who knows the one true and living God. Lot who should be acting in that same capacity of how believers should act when they know the one true and living God. And instead of showing an example to the world, what are they doing? They're fighting among each other. No, it's mine. No, it's mine. I want this. I want that. They're <clears throat> acting like the world. And again, the point that we can learn from this, the world has its eyes on we who call ourselves believers. And when we act the same as the world, what kind of a testimony is that for our God? You know, we can ruin our testimony right there by our actions. And it was shameful for God's men, I'll call them that, to fight before the devil's crowd because the world is the devil's crowd and we should show a better testimony than that to the world. But and the it, strife continues. Is it, it also possible too, uh, I've learned that, you know, the grass, the food for the, the animals got scarce because there's so much. And that's what they were afraid of and they were fighting for it. I'm not going to let mine be in need. I was here first or, you know, I've got more. or i got more right than you have. Who knows whatever reason. But they're fighting over it. And I just saw the clock. I realized I've got to find a stopping point. Um, I'm, maybe I should just stop right here because Avram's going to have to intervene. So it might be a good place to stop um, with verse 8. Um... I'll just tell you, we'll come back, we'll start with verse 8 next time, but the, the more I think about it, I think this is a good breaking point. Um, Avram's going to try to basically say, you know, let's not act like children, um, and he's going to show that he's learned a lot where, um, he, where he, what he needed to learn in Egypt, he did, okay, because we're going to see a change in his character. Like I said, we're going to see that Lot's possessions possessed him, where Avram is his possessions he was blessed with, but they weren't in control of him. And we're going to see Avram with more of a godly attitude than Lot and, and his attitude. We're going to see what appeals to Lot. Lot has an eye for the world. I'll, I'll say that because if you don't know the story, that's a big tip to what goes on. But any time that we are, our eyes on our possessions and on what the world can offer us, we're on a slippery slope. I'll just put out that warning. And next week, we will look at this. We'll see what Lot valued and what did Avram value. And that's where I'll show you where I think what Avram learned in Egypt, especially, too, because I think he, it did help him. He grew in the Lord through his hard time. And that's the one good thing. If you, if you go through a desert time, um, that's of your own doing, a rebellious time learn from it so that you don't make this, the mistakes again. But uh, we're going to see a battle. We're going to see a battle, um, not the Hatfields and the McCoys, but we're going to see a, a family struggle here, and we're going to see it set something in motion. One side has a, a very sad ending, and the other 
a much greater ending. But that is going to take us a while to get through all of that. Okay, so um, we're going to see, because we saw the descent of Avram and that, that brought him down into the world and away from the altar of the Lord, we're going to see the descent that Lot takes also spiritually a descent and it's a warning to us also so i think these lessons are here or these stories are here to be lesson stress for us to learn for us to um walk better with the lord because like you said earlier didn't avram talk to lot didn't he you know learn from this well he lived through it not only should he have been talked to but he should have seen it and maybe he was taught to, and he was seeing it, but he wasn't seeing it, and he wasn't hearing it. And uh, we just need to be... But his heart wasn't open. His heart was not. And we, it behooves us to be wise, so that we are hearing and seeing and being directed and corrected by the Lord easily, and not caught up in so much else. And I'm not here to critique anyone else, but I am here to say that the world it is very enticing to the believers it's not that you get saved and the world has you know it loses all its luster no satan knows what to dangle he knows the weak points and he'll mm -hmm. he'll be sure and trip that believer up with what where that weakness can be so what's the answer stay don't head toward ai the heap of ruins stay at Beit El, the house of god what are you doing when you're in the house of god Worship. worshiping him praising him, praying to him, studying his word. If we stay there, we're in a good place. <laughs> but again, not a place to be proud, a place to learn and to grow and to be more like the Lord so that we can withstand the wiles of the devil because he is cunning and deceptive, deceiving. He's ornery. Well, that's and that's happened. his good points. Yeah, that's what the COVID <laughs> did. Yeah, a lot of the Christians. COVID is a good have example. Eyes on the Lord, and they panicked with fear. COVID is a good example, and I'm not here to get into nitty gritty and and there are places in that that's strictly between yourself and God as to how He directed you. But I am here to say that those who, out of fear, took steps. I think are regretting those steps today you know so it, yeah there is a lot we need to be strong to withstand remember we said Avram if he would have stayed even if the famine was severe God wouldn't have let him starve mm -hmm. it might not have been the plenty that he was accustomed to and that he wanted but his needs would have been met my dad used to say God will meet your every need but not your every greed mm -hmm. You know, the Lord just really revealed to me there is a big change since the, the COVID and the voting, but people are moving in the will of God in different areas, and God is moving me also, but I am not sure where. But I do want to move, but because my car got broken into last Sunday, early morning, but still, God still worked it out <coughs> where. He brought me closer to my oldest grandson that was in the military, a police, but he was there for me the whole time. And, you know, I was able to really witness to him for the first time. So the Lord brought good out of that. that that's beautiful. It does not mean that we as believers don't have things happen to us. We do. And I try to encourage everyone, when you are in a hard place or something's happening that you don't understand, you do need to self-evaluate before the Lord. Is this a consequence? Is this, you know, a, a correction? Or is this a testing? Because God allows us into issues for both reasons, the testing and the growing, and also sometimes we reap the consequences of what we've done. But don't for a moment think that something bad's happening to you is because you're out of the will of God. If you're out of the will of God, I guarantee you, he can let you know that and you will know it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't make you guess, you know. But, um, but either which way, God can work it for good. And, uh, you know, what happened to you, Loretta, the Lord's already shown you how he's using it for good. So mm -hmm. let that be an encouragement to oh, you. I wasn't discouraged. The whole weekend from Friday on, I was attacked. 
you know, like yeah. Friday, I never had food poisoning before in my life. And I had food poisoning after I got to Orange County to help my sister. And boy, I tell you, and then Saturday and then Sunday morning at 2 a.m. But it had to wake up my apartment because they knew this has been going on. But where's the security? And then now we know the timing. Because there was a lot of witnesses at 1 a.m. that got off work. Why ain't someone telling security what's going on and cars are being broken into? It's hard. It's, it's a hard world. And may the Lord grant us his protection and his safety. I'm going to close in prayer real quick. I tried to close off class and I didn't quite succeed. Let me close in prayer. Then we'll open it for comments, for questions, you know, whatever needs to be said, okay? Lord God, we thank you for your faithfulness, for your hand upon us, that you bring us through, whether it's in spite of us, because of us, that it's always for us. That you even take our mistakes and you turn them for um, good coming out of them, that you take what was meant for evil and turn it for good. You are an amazing God. And we thank you. We, we just, we're so humbled at all that you give us and all that you do for us that it's not because we deserve it. Lord, as we enter into times of testing, let us draw closer to you and let us exemplify you to a world that needs that testimony. And where we have been off the path, Lord, let us own up to that as Avram did and turn around and go back to where we should be in the house of God with you. Thank you, your door is always open. Thank you that you always welcome the prodigal back in, that you are looking and watching for that prodigal and running to meet them when they finally turn back to you. So, Lord, you're a God of mercy. You're a God of love. You're a God of faithfulness. We see all of your attributes at work in the lives of these men. And Lord, we thank you that it speaks to us thousands of years later in our lives too. We so much to be thankful for. We praise you and we, we give you all the honor and glory Do your holy name as always. Praise on our lips, thanking you and praising you for who you are, the God of our salvation. In the name of, of Yeshua Jesus, our Messiah and Savior, amen. Amen. Okay.